title, we have this term optional intermediaries. And what we mean by that is simply a platform that users can choose to use or not to, in particular, to make purchases. So the um, examples would be that if you're going to say you're going to you're interested in buying a water filter, you can buy it via Amazon or you can go directly to the seller's website and buy it from the seller or you want to buy you want to order a meal you can uh, order you, you, you want to order meal a meal from a particular restaurant you can order it using an app like DoorDash or you can uh, call the restaurant or order directly from the restaurant's website similarly hotel rooms you know lots of examples like this um, and the pricing restraints that we're interested in are the so-called price parity clauses or as it's called in some of the literature, price coherence. So we're thinking about this distinction between the case where the um, platform imposes a price coherence restraint versus the case where the platform allows the sellers to have uh, price flexibility. And we're asking some pretty basic questions like what effect do these restraints have on consumer surplus and on total surplus? And when do platforms have an incentive to impose uh, price coherence? So for some context, these, this, this issue, these, the, the issue of the effects of um, price parity clauses and so forth has a long standing place in economic discussion and in policy discussions. Um, there's, uh, it's related to issues of credit card uh, payment card regulation. Um, another big issue that I'm sure people are familiar with has to do with most favored nation clauses. Um, and there, there's often a story about competition and the effects that these might have on competition that's not going to be part of what, what we look at. Uh, another one that's gotten, uh, another area that's got, gotten a lot of attention recently has to do with the rules that app stores um, set for software developers. Um, so I, you know, I'm not going to go into this too much because the goal in this paper is to remain quite abstract and to try to uncover a set of crucial driving forces um, in a pretty basic model of, of this um, situation. And these are forces that at least um, to the best of our knowledge are interesting and um, understandable, but also not, have not really received a clear treatment or, or as much attention as um, we think would be useful. Now, to preview a little bit, the model is very directly inspired by um, the model that appears in a paper um, by Julian Edelman, by Ben Edelman, sorry, Ben Edelman and Julian Wright, uh, in the QJE uh, 2015, which um, in a sense are motivation for um, getting involved with this with this topic was because uh, we found that paper. I mean, I saw Julian present that paper, saw Ben present that paper at Julian's conference a long time ago in Singapore and always found it to be um, really interesting. Um, and so it's particularly nice to have Julian as the discussant for, for this. Um, and one of the main findings, I, th I think this is a fair characterization, uh, a main finding of that paper is that price coherence tends to be harmful because it leads to excessive intermediation. It leads to, um, as the authors would, would probably put it, um, too many transactions going through the platform compared to what would be efficient. Um, and in a sense, um, as somebody who's flown all around the world uh, buying economy class tickets and often upgrading to business class, I found this story to be personally offensive and wanted to sort of test the limits of the theory saying that this uh, you know, that, that, that there's this excessive intermediation, uh, intermediation. but of course, um, all joking aside, uh, the, uh, 
the, the issues there were, were, were really very interesting, but also seemed like they called for just a, a bit of, um, you know, we, we felt motivated to, um, to, to understand them further. Um, and so in this paper, our contribution is to really change the model of the, the good market compared to what's in that paper. Um, in that paper, there's a good market which uses a salop circle demand uh, configuration. And here we're going to, in a sense, make things more basic by just looking at a monopoly seller rather than competition among sellers. Um, but we're also going to relax assumptions on demand curvature and the sort of punchline will be that under low convexity demand, uh, price coherence can be surprisingly good for consumers and for total welfare. Um, it's even possible that the platform lacks sufficient incentive to require price coherence. And these results um, stem from what strikes us as, as an interesting effect that we call the drawing in effect, whereby price coherence spurs purchases, spurs more purchases by consumers who have low valuations for the good, which is kind of an interesting theme because if you listen to some of the discussion about, um, if you listen to some of the discussion about, say, American Express or um, other platforms that impose this kind of restraint, there's a sense that their imposition of the constraint benefits relatively wealthy people or high valuation consumers at the expense of, of low valuation consumers. And while we're not trying to take this too, you know, push this too far, there, there, there is something kind of interesting to think about here about the, the, what's driving this and that it's really the low valuation consumers who are being drawn into the, into the market when you have um, uh, price coherence imposed by the platform. All right, so I will go to the model now. Um, we have a platform, uh, a unit mass of buyers, and a single merchant. Um, and the basic setup is one where, in the absence of a platform, it would just be sort of the simplest, most plain vanilla monopoly model that you can imagine. Buyers each, you know, buyers have unit demand for a good sold by the merchant. They have um, valuation V for, for the good that comes from some, in, you know, drawn from an interval between zero and V bar. And there's a um, distribution of valuations G. So in the absence of the platform, the merchant would be a monopolist with demand given by this function Q. And um, it would, we're assuming that it has zero marginal cost. But now we add the platform to the mix. Um, buyers have the same valuations for the good, but there are two groups of buyers, uh, a share lambda of them are just non-users who are going to behave exactly as the um, users would in the monopoly model. They just purchase if the valuation for the good is greater than the price. And PD here is, is denotes, uh, I'll be a little bit more formal with the notation in a second of, of prices here. PD is the, the price to buy, the, the price that you have to pay to buy directly. Um, then there's the one minus lambda share of users and they have the choice to either purchase directly, so they get V minus PD because they've uh, paid directly, they've, they've bought directly and paid the direct price, or they can purchase via the platform, in which case they get a bonus B, which you can think about as being um, a number of different things. It could be, for example, free delivery um, that you get from uh, the, pl the platform, whereas you might have otherwise had to go pick it up. It can pick the good up. It can be a, an improved ability to return the good or a warranty service. So, so you can think about the B being a lot of different things. This B is homogeneous across users, whereas the Vs are, everybody has an individual B, an individual V, but the B is homogeneous in this model. 
Um, and then if you buy through the platform, you potentially pay a different price and PM uh, denotes the mediated price. Um, so one important concept is just this one of net price where you have um, PM minus B as sort of the, the relevant thing. If somebody is gonna, if a user is gonna purchase through the platform, the relevant comparison is between V and the net price. And we compare two regimes, um, the one price flexibility where the merchant can set price directly, um, set, sorry, set the direct price PD and also the mediated price PM. Um, we compare this with price coherence, which um, is a regime where the platform has imposed that the merchant is allowed to just set one price for both direct sales and mediated sales, and that's uh, we call P hat. And from this setup, we can write the merchant's profits under the two regimes. And this is very straightforward. Um, you know, the, the merchant is receiving a lambda share of profits from the non users in both regimes, and then a one minus lambda share from the users in both regimes. Um, of course, the prices are going to be important here in the, the price coherence is in some sense simpler because everybody every user is going to be paying p hat um, but it's important to just you know do the right mechanics here uh, the price that matters in, in terms of determining the marginal consumer for the um, case of uh, mediated sale or for users is the net price because they're going to be getting they're going to be comparing you know users will be comparing their v valuation for the good with the net price um, whereas for non-users the only thing they care about is just p and then also as far as the marginal cost we, we've assumed that there's zero marginal cost for the seller of of producing the good but there's this fee there's this transaction fee F that's set by the platform. And so that's an endogenous quantity. Um, and so for all purchases made um, by users via the, if users choose to make the purchase via the platform, uh, then the merchant incurs the marginal cost F, whereas um, if non-users buy, or if potentially if a user were to um, not make the purchase via the platform, but instead purchase directly, then the F wouldn't be, wouldn't be part of the store, it wouldn't be a marginal cost. So um, in the basic model, the timing is as follows. Um, and then I'll relax this a bit even more at the, at the I'm gonna proceed in three steps, um, which you'll see the, the but to, to fix ideas, let's think about this timing. Um, first, the platform does two things. It sets the fee, F, the per transaction fee, and it also chooses um, whether to allow the merchant to have price flexibility or to impose the price coherence restraint. Um, and I just, just to clarify, in the main setup, in the main setup, F is a per transaction fee but in the paper, we also allow it to be an ad valorem fee. So in practice, you tend to see these things as uh, fees that are proportional to the revenue of the transaction rather than a per transaction fee. And the results that I'm going to, so, so this setup that I'm talking about and that we have in the main text of the paper is a per transaction fee, but that turns out um, not to be a crucial factor for the, for the results. And it's, it's just more, Sort of more cumber a lot of the calculations are more cumbersome when you do the proportional fee um but we derive we derive everything in the appendix involving it when we use a um, using a proportional fee um okay so that's what the platform does then after once the platform is moved the merchant chooses whether to participate on the platform um if it participates, then under flexibility, it sets the two prices. And if it participates under coherence, 
then it sets the one price as we've discussed. Then um, all of the buyers are going to choose whether to purchase the good. Um, in solving this problem, the users, the, the ones, the buyers who are platform users can choose whether to make their purchases via the platform or to make them directly. Um, all right, so in, in um, this version of the story, the um, buyer's status as either a user or a non-user is exogenously given and, and it's captured by this lambda. Um, and then at the end, and, and as in the Edelman and Wright paper, um, that's an endogenous choice and I'll talk about that. Um, um, but for, for simplicity, this setup, you know, just note that this setup is not making the choice of whether to become a user or not endogenous. Um, the um, one ask, sort of... Sorry, Alex, can I ask please, you a quick question? Please. Um, the platform users, so here you assume that they are aware of the merchant, right? So the platform doesn't create uh, the... doesn't create exactly. awareness for, for, the, for the brand. Exactly, yes. No, so the issue of sort of search or providing more opportunities is not something that we're building into this story. Absolutely correct. Thank you. Um, and so the, the sort of one main assumption on the environment is that demand is strictly globally long, log concave. And so we're varying um, you know, so demand curvature is going to be an important thing here, but it's not like a lot of papers on demand curvature where we say something like everything you thought was true under log concave demand turns out to be flipped around 180 degrees when demand is log convex. That's not, I mean, that, that's sort of the story of every other paper that I write, but um, in this story, we're just restricting attention to um, log concave demand. And then the, in a sense, the interesting thing seems to be when demand is is a bit more you know a bit less convex than than the upper bound of this um whoops what did i do um all right so in the in the first bit of analysis and, and to sort of illustrate the main effect i'm going to be just talking about exogenous transaction fees so i'm going to be doing a comparison of the um coherence versus flexi flexibility regimes. But for, for now, let's not even think about the optimal choice of F. Let's just say that there's some F um, and that that's gonna be held fixed across the two regimes. And then we're gonna relax that and think about the effect of varying the F, opti the, you know, of allowing the platform to vary F optimally in accordance with its choice of regime. Um, so there's just, a strictly positive transaction fee and you know some of the details that are in the paper will show that you know in order for this to make sense this f has to lie somewhere in this interval where it's greater than zero but below um and a, a level f upper bar f upper bar which is strictly less than b and as long as uh, f lies in this interval um described here, the merchant would have an incentive to participate regardless of which regime the uh, platform sets. So that's so what so in this first exercise, we're just going to assume that F is in this interval. And then we solve the problem of participation for the merchant. Um, and so the first lemma says that given any such transaction fee that leads the merchant to participate under flexibility or coherence, the following ranking holds. Um, and so this, you know, first you can look at just these sort of the, these nominal prices. This is, this is very straightforward. It says that if you think about the direct price and the mediated price, um, the mediated price is greater under flexibility. The mediated price is going to be greater than the direct price. Why is that? Well, there's a boost in demand that the users get from um, getting that, but that benefit B from using the platform that the non-users don't get from just purchasing directly. So the mediated price is higher than the direct price. And if price coherence gets imposed, then the uniform price is going to 
be you know some kind of a weighted average of these two things it's because it's going to be the price that applies to both both groups and it's going to be in the middle um so that's nominal prices but then we can think about net prices so this is sort of the prices that determine the the cutoff or determine who the marginal users are and the net so the, the only net price that matters is obviously for users, not for the non-users. The, the, the net price for users under, right? So, so this, this inequality is, is, this first one is implied by um, th this other one that the net price under uh, coherence has to be lower than the net price under flexibility, but also the net price under flexibility is lower than the direct price. Um, and two takeaways that we use from this lemma are first that coherence has a drawing in effect. And by that, what do we mean? Well, when we think about the marginal users, the ones who have the lowest valuation in all of this are the marginal users under coherence. Um, marginal users under coherence have lower valuations for the good um, than do marginal users under um, flexibility. And these are all buyers with lower valuations than the marginal non-user. Um, and then secondly, the spread between marginal users and non-users valuations for the good is greater under coherence than under flexibility. Um, so these properties are useful in allowing us to get to the first result. So um, I'm going to talk about consumer surplus under the two regimes in this setting. And to do so, I want to introduce this so-called undershooting condition. So this is just with this is just a condition that you can um, in, that you can ask whether it is satisfied or not with any set of three exogenous prices. And so we say that un, you know, so so this is the um, p hat is the um, price is is a price that might arise under price coherence. P d is a direct price and p m is a um, mediated price. And so undershooting holds when under coherence, the merchant's nominal price weakly undershoots the population weighted average of the direct and mediated prices it charges under flexibility. So, right, so you look at the, um, you, you, you look at flexibility, the prices that uh, prevail under flexibility, um, and then you take a population weighted average of those two, compare it to the um, price that arises under price coherence. If that latter price is lower than the population weighted average, then we say that undershooting, um, the undershooting condition is satisfied. Um, and so the first proposition just involves exogenous pricing. This is just for any set of prices um, and net prices ranked as in the lemma. If this undershooting condition is satisfied, then consumer surplus is greater under coherence than it is under flexibility. Uh, and that's um, to, to talk about this, let's let's look at this graph. Um, and in a way, this graph has a lot of the intuition that is, I think, nice from from the paper and that that drives um, drives the results that I that I think are new. So I'll talk for a bit about this. Um, you can start off by thinking about a benchmark where you have. Uh, uh, and this benchmark comes from the paper in the Rand paper of Chen and Schwartz 
where they look at differential pricing versus uniform pricing in a context where a seller has two different markets with two different marginal costs. So you can think about a seller that simply faces a single demand curve, the, the same demand curve in both of two markets, but um, it uh, has low marginal cost in one market and high marginal cost in another. And then in that setting, you compare consum consumer surplus under differential pricing versus uniform pricing. And the, the basic effect you would get there is that when you impose a uniform pricing constraint, you get a reduction in the high price and an increase in the low price. And this tends to harm consumer surplus because the increase of the low price um, is excluding, is, is cutting off consumer surplus that's, that's given by this area A. And the decrease in the high price is just creating this new consumer surplus that's um, represented by the area B. And you know, the reason for this comes from the ranking of the marginal consumers, that when you're adding people who are relatively high valuation, the, the, this, this stems from the um, convexity of the consumer surplus function, in effect. When you're adding consumers with high valuations and taking away consumers with low valuations, this uh, will tend to decrease consumer surplus. However, in our setting, we're, we need to take into account the net prices and the net prices for the users here are the P minus Bs. These are the platform users who are getting some benefit from using the platform. So the, the crucial thing is that um, the, you know, the sort of idiosyncratic feature that causes users to decide whether to buy or not is their V. But in terms of users ranking uh, compared to non-users, the B is going to essentially shift the, them from being these high value, the, the marginal users is, are in, instead of being relatively high valuation users, they're gonna be relatively low valuation users compared to the non-users. And so when you go from flexibility to coherence, um, instead of bringing in new people whose valuations add up to consumer surplus of area B, you get you know, this, this taller area, B plus C. And so, you know, the, the point is that the gain from this, the, the gain in consumer surplus from this um, imposition is, is, is a positive one, that the overall net effect on consumer surplus is a positive one because of the, uh, the um, propensity to attract the low valuation consumers rather than the high valuation consumers. So I hope I've made that you know, as clear as I can in a short period of time. So now I'll go to the more endogenous result. And to do this, we will focus on the particular form of demand, constant pass-through demand. So this gamma is a um, parameter that when it's uh, um, greater makes demand um, less and less concave. Um, and when gamma is equal to one, we just have uh, linear demand. Um, so proposition two with endogenous pricing, under constant pass-through demand, the merchant chooses prices that satisfy the undershooting condition if and only if gamma is less than or equal to one. Therefore, if gamma is less than or equal to one, consumers uh, coherence gives rise to greater consumer surplus than flexibility. So this in particular says that for the case of linear demand, consumer surplus is greater under coherence than flexibility. And also note that the linear demand tightly satisfies the undershooting condition, but this undershooting condition is stronger than necessary to guarantee that consumer surplus is higher under coherence. So for analytical purposes, the undershooting condition is useful, but it's not necessary for the result that coherence 
gives rise to higher consumer surplus than flexibility. Um, and here's a graph that talks a bit more about, th this, this shows a bit more of what I was just saying about the relationship between the undershooting condition and then the, just the consumer surplus comparison. So here, the key thing is on the x-axis, that's the gamma parameter measuring convexity. One gamma equals one is the case of linear demand. So that's the, bo that's the border between the under to the left of for, for values of gamma less than one undershooting is satisfied for gamma is greater than one undershooting is not satisfied but for the entire blue area so roughly speaking for values of gamma that are two or lower in this example um, consumer surplus is greater under coherence um, now um, the next step uh, I'm going to be wrapping up soon, so I'll just sort of walk you through the the um, the the sort of next steps to make this a bit. You know, my, my emphasis has has been to try to um, focus on the new effects, and now I'm going to kind of make things more endogenous. The next step is to just endogenize the um, the fees f, um, so that there's a um, regime specific F rather than just holding the F fixed across the two um, the two regimes. And the um, the bottom line here is that endogenizing the F to make it regime specific is going to help the case for coherence. Um, so to talk about this, we first think about a condition that we call primacy of the good. Um, and this just says that the valuation for the good, this just basically says that the platform benefit is not too big. The valuation for the good of the marginal buyer in the absence of a platform um, inflated by the local pass-through rate. So that's something that has to be less than, less than one under log concave demand, um, exceeds the benefit that the platform brings exceeds uh, versus buying directly that that's bigger than B. So, you know, is the, the, this condition basically says we're not in an environment where the B's are so important relative to the um, marginal consumers valuation for the good itself. Um, and then proposition three says that if this if condition two holds, then the platforms transaction fee under coherence is less than the transaction fee under flexibility. Um, and um, so I then can, can give a similar type of result for linear demand. Um, the following statements are true. The transaction fee that the platform sets under coherence is strictly lower than the one it sets under flexibility. Consumer surplus is greater under coherence than under flexibility. and in the unique subgame perfect equilibrium of the game, the platform cho chooses to impose coherence. And um, moreover, total surplus is greater under coherence. Um, extending that from linear demand to the case of constant pass through demand, um, we get a graph that looks similar to the one I just showed. But here, this graph is. Okay, so the first thing to note, um, the borderline between condition one being satisfied or not is no longer a, um, it, it moves up, right? The undershooting condition is easier to satisfy now because of the fact that the transaction fee is lower under coherence than it is under flexibility. And so that makes uh, it more likely that undershooting will be satisfied. Um, and the, the, the one thing sort of, the, in, in a sense, um, the, the one thing that can go wrong here is that the, when demand is too concave, the platform will have an incentive to um, choose flex, not to impose coherence, to choose flexibility, even though the, um, 
even though imposing coherence would be better for um, total surplus and consumer surplus. Um, so now, finally, the, the, the last thing to do is to endogenize user participation. Um, and so the setup here just follows uh, the Edelman and Wright setup where um, each buyer can, in, can choose whether to become a user or not. Um, but signing up to, for the platform causes the user to incur a joining cost C. Um, so here we just get this timing where Okay, the platform is still moving first, setting the fee F and choosing the flexibility, choosing the regime. Um, but now in the second stage, there's the simultaneous moves where um, buyers are observing their value of C and deciding whether or not to join the platform. And at the same time, the merchant is um, deciding whether to join the platform and setting prices. Um, and Alex, what do I, I should probably wrap up in, in like two minutes or what would you say? Uh, a bit more. I, uh, you've got four minutes. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't. I don't want to get into too much detail given the the time constraint. Um, we have a way of per, the, the, you know we have a way of parameterizing the distribution of joining costs so that we have we sort of mix a uniform distribution of joining costs between those with zero cost and those with some cost C upper bar that's prohibitively high so that they would never join the platform. And um, the point is we have a mass, you know, the important thing is we have a mass of people with joining costs that are zero and then another mass of people with joining costs that are um, laid out over this interval. So some consumers are potentially marginal or in, um, potentially you know, it, it would be unclear whether they would join the platform or not, whereas other users with zero joining costs are definitely joining the platform. Um, and so I'm just going to give an example here under linear demand with specific parameter values. Um, but this is, you know, the, the specific parameter values, it's not like we chose these, it's not like choosing them in a very special way is important for what I'm going to say. Um, the main thing is just not to keep, not to let the B, the benefit get too high relative to sort of the, the valuations for the good. When that's true for all of these parameterizations of um, joining costs, the platform and at equilibrium, the platform chooses to impose price coherence and it sets F equal to this upper bound um, F bar. More, joy, more buyers join under coherence than under flexibility. So this is a key sort of um, similarity to the result, the theme of the Edelman and Wright paper, um, the marginal, the, 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 the cost, the joining cost of the marginal buyer under coherence is greater than the joining cost of the marginal buyer under flexibility. Um, and total surplus and, and the consumer surplus derived from purchasing the good are greater under coherence than under flexibility. Um, but regarding um, the total consumer surplus, including consumer surplus from transaction costs and from joining costs, that's what is a bit more ambiguous. It requires that there be enough um, zero joining cost users relative to these interior users in order to make it so that um, net consumer surplus is higher under um, coherence. So, to wrap up, I just will mention a couple of policy considerations. This last point raises a, a new trade-off that I don't think is known or present in the, certainly not from the Edelman and Wright paper about the um, um, comparison between transaction surplus as a benefit from coherence versus um, excessive joining. So coherence may at the same time um, lead to greater transaction surplus while it also um, can lead to, to this higher joining costs at equilibrium. And so um, these two things should be weighed against one another. I mean, that our, our model is saying that it's important to weigh these things against one another in this context. And I think a, um, 
regarding policy interventions, a particular thing to think about is the timing of policy interventions. If you think about some policy that might potentially ban price coherence or you know, put restraints on the ability of a platform to, to, to do this kind of price coherence, um, you have to be careful about doing it in a setting where the, where the users have primarily already joined. Because in a sense, if you're in a mature industry where users have already joined and then you come in and um, impose this kind of uh, a, a policy that gets rid of price coherence. There's the potential, you know, our model says that suggests that there's the potential that you would be sort of trying to close the, the barn door after the horse has already gotten out in the sense that the joining costs may already have been incurred. Um, and the you could further um, damage things by reducing the consumer surplus. So, um, you know, with that being said, this is obviously an abstract model, and we're doing this in the context, of, you know, in a very specific context. But I hope that this has been, um, you know, th that this has been useful for um, shedding light on these these underlying effects. So, to conclude, in this paper, we model optional intermediaries and address the incentives and the effects of price coherence restraints. We find that demand curvature plays a crucial role. And in low convexity environments, price coherence tends to boost consumer surplus and total surplus. Um, when demand is sufficiently concave, the platform may inefficiently prefer not to impose coherence. Um, and the reason why coherence helps is due to the drawing in effect. Um, the coherence restraint stimulates purchases by platform users with relatively low valuations for the good. So with that, I'll finish um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, uh, for this very clear presentation. And uh, now we have a discussant, um, Julian Wright. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, it was a nice presentation and um, I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, you know, the the idea that price coherence could be actually really good for consumers um, is one that naturally is an interesting possibility to explore. And of course, other papers in the literature have found trade-offs between, um, you know, the sort of multiple effects, and it could go either way. But none as clear and simple as the mechanism that you've put forward, which is, you know, it makes it, um, you know, nice to discuss. Uh, so. What I want, thought I would talk about is sort of, first of all, the connection to our paper. And I think more broadly than our QGE paper, the earlier literature on credit cards and uh, no surcharge rules, which is you know basically equivalent to price coherence or price parity clauses. Uh, and you know, Alex, you identified one key difference, which is in those models, we're looking at competing merchants with unit demand. I think that's not just in our paper, but in some of the earlier papers like Roche and Tirols and so on, um, where they had hoteling model. Whereas in your paper, you have mo monopoly seller facing elastic demand, right? Downward sloping demand. And so you have this new drawing in effect, which um, seems quite plausible, uh, which we didn't have. And of course, you know, if you think about these markets where platforms are, you know, imposing price coherence, I guess there is a question, which is a more natural way of modeling it? Is it a monopoly seller facing elastic demand that has the ability to price to different buyers based on demand? Um, or is it more that prices are determined by competition and just passing through the fees that they face? So, I mean, that's obviously an empirical question. But um, in some sense, what I thought you're capturing with the monopoly seller, which can price discriminate um, is that price discrimination by monopoly seller uh, is bad for consumers under you know, certain demand conditions. And I think those demand conditions are satisfied in your, in your setting. So to some extent, you're sort of capturing that idea that you know, price discrimination is bad and we want to have, we don't want to have monopolists price discriminating. We want to have them setting uniform prices that helps consumers. Um, now, um, aside from 
that difference, which is, you know, obviously comp competing sellers versus monopoly seller, I think there's another difference between um, this earlier literature and what you're doing, uh, which you didn't sort of draw out so much, which is um, in our paper, we allow the benefit fee to be in sort of endogenously determined by the platform's investment. In the earlier payments literature, they allowed there to be a rebate or a fee charged to the buyer side, which the platform determined. And so typically, you know, um, they might set a high seller fee and they might set a rebate to consumers. Uh, and so a natural question is what happens in your framework if you allow for that kind of endogeneity of well, two-sided pricing, basically, right? Because um, I'm just trying to connect what you do in that earlier literature. And that seems to me the only other key difference. Um, the other point I wanted to make, so this is sort of going now a bit beyond um, that earlier literature in our, our 2015 paper, is like in that paper and as in your paper, the platform never charges more than be the transaction benefit that it provides, right? Um, and that, of course, makes it harder for price coherence to, to be bad. And, you know, that was a constraint we had to work under in our earlier paper. And that's why I had this sort of cost mechanism with excessive intermediation. But of course, if you think more broadly about these platforms that provide a discoverability for the sellers, right? Um, so they're providing, you know, cheaper search for buyers to find sellers. Then there's other reasons why um, the platform may be able to charge beyond this transaction benefit. Because if, you know, if the seller doesn't join, they're not discovered and they're willing to pay more than the transaction benefit to be discovered. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of the work that I did with Cheng Zi Wang um, in the RAND paper and other work uh, where you actually see a much stronger sort of negative effect of price parity on consumers because the platform can actually go well, well beyond the transaction benefits. Um, and prevent the natural showrooming that would happen in that case by imposing price parity. Um, so I think that, you know, that's the sort of one related point to that, sort of my last point uh, and coming back to your model that, um, you know, if you think about it in terms of there being two demands, right? Demands of the non-users and demands of the users. The demands of the users have higher willingness to pay because they get B from going through the platform. Um, so my question would be, what happens if you have the reverse situation, which is actually the demand function for the non-users has high willingness to pay? Would the sort of conclusions reverse? And the reason I ask that is because if you think about the direct consumers, they may not be as price sensitive as the consumers that are coming to the platform. Like if you think about hotel bookings, right? The direct consumers may be not the ones that are searching as much. They may not be as price sensitive. They may actually have a different demand function than the ones coming through the platform. And so, you know, had some idea that the uh, willingness to pay of the direct consumers may be higher. Um, and more generally that captures the idea that the direct consumers may be more captive uh, to the sellers and therefore they have a chance to charge them higher prices. So, you know, that, that seems like it might have some interesting effects in your setting. And I'll, I better stop here in the interest of time. Very nice paper, thank you. Thanks, Julian. Um, thank Alex, you, Julian. Alex, do you wanna take a couple of minutes to answer Julian's points? And in, in the meantime, uh, uh, to the, the participants, uh, feel free to answer our questions in the chat. Well, thank you, Julian. I think that those are all very good questions, and um, some of them we've thought about. Some of them we've, you know, some of them we've thought more about. Some of them we haven't thought as much about. And um, you know, I, I I don't feel as though it's important to go one by one between them because I do, I do I do think that they're all very good questions. And you know, I certainly don't intend the thrust of this presentation or of this paper to be. Um, proselytizing that um, price coherence is good under all circumstances so that you know we don't need to worry about it because I think there are a lot of reasons why we do need to be worried about it and you know the intent here is very much to just clarify our thinking and understand this force 
and how it fits in rather than um, say anything um, sort of more ambitious, you know, overly ambitious, uh, more ambitious than that. Um, the uh, showrooming is another factor that is very important in this context. And, you know, Julian and, and others have, um, have, have, have done very interesting work on that. Um, also, I think that the, um, one, one of the things that we worked on early in this uh, research didn't actually involve investment in the, um, the bees. So in, in the, it's indeed true that in the Edelman and Wright paper, there's this endogenous investment by the platform in creating the bee. Um, and um, there, there's something interesting there that's not in this paper, but that um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get around to writing up at some point, it, it sort of ended up being something that was a bit peripheral to the main point of this paper, where you can also have, if you have heterogeneity in the bees and you have the investment, there's a potential for a kind of Spence distortion there, where the um, platform focuses on the bee of the marginal, a certain type of marginal user, whereas the social planner would care about the bee of the um, inframarginal users, which is, as far as I know, I don't think that's in the QJE paper, uh, I, I could be wrong about that, but that's another, you know, the, the, this is just to say that there are a lot of interesting issues here that um, I, you know, I hope that we get a chance to address either in this future version of this paper or in, in subsequent work. Um, and that, you know, the goal here is just to be clear headed and identify this new, this, uh, you know, this particular aspect of the relevant mechanics. Um, so, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs>